You're 16, a Ringo Starr song, Hot Child in the City. Mm. Um, I saw her standing there, the Beatles song. She was just 17. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, uh, my Sharona, my favorite, my anti-favorite, I guess, in this regard is a song by Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, which was very popular in right. the 60s, kind of a bubblegum group. But they had a gigantic number one song called Young Girl. Young Girl, Get Out of My Mind. My love for you is way out of line. And it goes right. it goes on. And we're reassessing a lot of things now. Um, I, I won't put rock songs in the same category as Confederate monuments, but they're not that far off from yeah. monuments. Non-factual speech flourishes. It expands. It, it metastasizes. So that the power of the mainstream media to vet what is and is not factual information is severely restricted and diminished. And so, you know, good luck, everybody, with your free-for-all. You have this thriving marketplace of false information, and it leads to a challenge to an election. It, le it, it leads to the undermining of democracy is what it leads to. You know, I was interested in this, you know, display of cultural insensitivity that, <laughs> that you are thinking about. You know, how did you get onto that? And why did you, I assume you are a baby boomer. So I was wondering I, how I am, you- Yes, I am a late stage baby boomer born in 58. So yeah. that gets me in the, the, the demographic. Um, and probably more importantly, I kind of grew up listening to whatever the nostalgia station in Los Angeles was, and I can't remember. So I really liked 60s music. I like 70s music, um, still do. Um, I like modern music, um, but uh, anyway, um, so my frame of reference is in those decades. And a friend of mine said, you know, yes, sex, drugs, rock and roll, but a lot of it is really insensitive by modern standards, contemporary standards. And, yeah. and, and maybe, well, I, I don't know. It, it, can we say the same of 50s music? Can we say the same of 40s music? Well, can maybe. we say the same of the 2000s music? Ex yeah. Yes, we can. And, and then we can, because, you know, I, this isn't to, to make relative comparisons. I'm just going to take that period of time, 60s, 70s, 80s, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I looked at it from like the, the arrival of the Beatles to the arrival of MTV. That's about a 20 year period. OK, so right. in the 20 year period, you have huge rock acts, the Stones, the Beatles, on and on. And a lot of it, when you look closely at it, and we didn't at the time it was coming out, starts to look really kind of problematic. So, for instance, my favorite example is Brown Sugar, the Rolling Stones, staple of classic rock. And we never thought about the lyrics at the time. And I bet you most people couldn't even quote the lyrics because it's sort of garbled in the way it's sung. But it opens this way. Gold Coast slave ship bound for cotton fields sold in a market down in New Orleans. OK, now we're getting somewhere. This is about <laughs> right. slavery. Scarred old slaver knows he's doing all right. Hear him whip the women just around midnight. <laughs> Uh, well, okay, that's, uh, you know, you're singing about a, uh, a slave driver who, or slave seller who yeah. whips women. And then it goes on, of course, the chorus is brown sugar. How come you taste so good? Right. And Mick Jagger um, has been interviewed about this and he said, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means and it doesn't really mean anything at all, but mm -hmm. it's very easy to impute a few things into those lyrics um, which, you know, one of them is about this idea of whipping women and slavery yeah. and kind of, in effect, celebrating slavery. That's a bad look right off. Uh, on another level, it's about interracial sex, which, uh, you know, I don't necessarily have any problem with. On another level, still, brown sugar refers to heroin. And mm -hmm. uh, um, so there's a lot going on there that I don't think people, you know, when you're a kid, you thought too much about. But I think in hindsight, it does look pretty bad. I mean, I guess the question is, is can you judge another time period peering back on it from a distance? Because it is so hard to understand. You know, not everybody wrote like Lincoln. You know what I mean? Yes, of course. And I have another, and I have a question to that also, because I remember that song growing up. Okay. I'm a boomer. 
And um, I never, I never, I don't think I heard the words, kind of what you're saying. That's right. And also, why are we now, is it this time, this woke that we're in, that we're suddenly scrutinizing? And I love Jesse's question because is it about time and place? And, you know, he didn't come off Mick Jagger as a racist or a sexist. He was very androgynous and sexually, he didn't know what was going on with him. So how, what, what do you think accounts for for all of this? I, I think, and that's a great question, I think that it, every era is subject to this kind of looking back. Um, there's always contemporary standards and our mm -hmm. contemporary standards obviously change over time. And those songs become a hallmark, a, a notation of their era. But you know, we're reassessing a lot of things now. Um, I, I won't mm -hmm. put rock songs in the same category as Confederate monuments, but they're not that far off from yeah. monuments. Their uh, Confederate monuments were of a time and place. And I think most reasonable people would agree they've outlived their usefulness and their purpose in the same way that some of the songs of, of our youth have, have done so. Just to go a little further with this, though, I, I, I wanted to point to a whole bunch of songs, very popular in their day, that really have problematic sexual relations in them. And I don't mean just misogynist uh -huh. relationships, but underage relationships between an adult male and an underage female. Uh, You're 16, a Ringo Starr song, Hot Child in the City. Mm. Um, I saw her standing there, the Beatles song. She was just 17, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, uh, My Sharona has a reference in it, which I never even realized at the time. My favorite, my anti-favorite, I guess, in this regard is a song by Gary Puckett and the Union Gap, which was very popular in right. the 60s, kind of a bubblegum group, but they had a gigantic number one song called Young Girl. Young Girl, Get Out of My Mind, My Love for You is Way Out of Line. And it goes, right. it goes on. And anyway, I mean, I think reassessment is, is reasonable and, and important in a way. I mean, we've reassessed Picasso uh, in the context of knowing more of how he treated his models and the women mm -hmm. he associated with. Woody Allen has been reassessed um, in, in light of what we know about his uh, various uh, relationships. And so, you know, it's not unreasonable to apply contemporary standards. Do, do things look different by the, the frame of contemporary standards looking back? Yes, of course they do. Um, well, I mean, one thing is that um, we might be the first generation that has persistent memory looking back because, you know, if we were in the 60s, you couldn't really look back at the 20s and really have an understanding of the context of, of you know, what was going on. And I think that some of this, there's egregious examples, of some of the ones you bring up, but it's also that we're able to look back and, and never have we been able to look back and put ourselves in the moment more because of film and recordings than we ever have in the past. Absolutely true. It's absolutely true. And you know, even though this is nostalgic to some extent, it's actually contemporary for just the reasons you say. I mean, turn on the TV and every commercial pharmaceuticals or what have you that's trying to appeal to baby boomers uses the soundtrack of this time because uh -huh. it's well known. And there are plenty of young people who know these songs too. I point to another factor, Jesse, that, that I, I think it is important, which is we didn't know the lyrics because most of them weren't published at the time. Mm -hmm. You could sort of suss them out by listening to the radio. But now we have these internet lyric sites that, you know, tell us everything about these songs. Yeah. And so uh, we can look and we can look them up, which I did, and, and, and find out what was going on in these songs. And, you know, I, I, this isn't to get into canceling anything. It's just mm -hmm. saying, hey, take a look here. And maybe yeah. some of the things you celebrated shouldn't have been celebrated. What made you, know, you want to explore that, though? Like, what was it that you said, wait, I got to go, you know, what was, a, what was kind of the defining moment to go look? Yeah, well, uh, strangely enough, um, it was one song, which I remember as a little kid, it was called Kung Fu Fighting. You know this song? Sure. Everybody was Kung Fu. One of the, actually, one of, as I found out in looking this up, one of the biggest selling single records of its time came out in mm -hmm. the 70s, sold like 11 million copies or whatever. But if you listen to that song, and it's dopey, it's silly, it's a novelty song, mm -hmm. but it has a couple of lyrics about funky Chinamen from right. funky Chinatown. 
and then it uses a bunch of seemingly Asian names. Also musically, it has a kind of cliche, mm-hmm. stereotypical, I, I think there's a name for it, Asian sound, dink a dink a dink 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 mm-hmm. you know, which was used in like movies, Charlie Chan movies of the 30s and 40s mm. to signify, you know, Asian culture. And it's it's a it's a gross stereotype in its own uh, musical way. And, you know, once you get to thinking about, about that silly song, well, there's a few more that aren't quite so silly. You know, it's, it's interesting just because those, those songs, I think they probably were, they were made for the moment. I don't think at that time yeah. people really thought that there was, you know, that this would be the soundtrack of our lives. So sure. maybe they didn't put as much thought or, or were even capable of putting as much thought into the actual lyrics at the time, you know? But, but I would also say there was a certain kind of consciousness, Jesse. I mean, that uh, we didn't, we in the moment didn't have the awareness or the thought that saying funky Chinamen was in its way insulting to a whole group of people. Now, of course, I think people would be appalled by, by that kind of usage and, and such a throwaway usage at that. I mean, if you want to attack that Kind of thing. I, I mean, I'll give you an example uh, from your own family. Uh, your dad has a song called Hurricane, which is a great song. And um, it uses the N word. And this song came out in about 1975. I love this song. And it's, it's a very journalistic song about Reuben Carter and mm-hmm. the injustice done to Reuben Carter. And it describes within the song the reaction in the Black community to Reuben Carter that, and it, it signifies that even black people at the time thought he was a no good character. And so I'd, I'd say that's a justifiable use of the N-word. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, try finding a white uh, musician or a non-black uh, musician using that word today, I think people would, would have a, a different reaction. Uh, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, I mean, I think that's the one and only time you ever used that, that word and it was used for for a specific purpose within that song. And, and he is a co-writer in that song because I don't think my, uh, my dad's ever used any uh, songs like that, any lyrics like that in the past. Um, but and yes, it is true. It makes it a great song, uh, not that particular usage, but uh, the, the, the whole documentary quality of that song really makes it a very mm. powerful song. And in fact, that song led to uh, Reuben Carter's release uh, ultimately. Yep. Um, I, uh, I remember going to see Reuben Carter in jail. My dad performed uh, in the jail with him. Wow. Uh, we were, he was allowed to do a concert there when I was uh, very young. Uh, yeah, that was, those were wild times. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's like, how do we, how do we um, like, you know, you were talking about the Confederacy. It's so strange as Americans, you know, because that, none of that happened during the Civil War. That's all in the 20s. Right. You know, daughters of the Confederacy built all those statues, but but um uh and and it's interesting that we would have statues to a lost you know to the to the side that lost the war. It's totally bizarre that these statues these are basically traitors. You know that we built statues to, um and I think it is important to reassess that. I mean, I wonder how, and I think to a certain extent, it's always important for every generation to look back on the previous generation and and make decisions about where we are culturally, but what, what, how does it make you think about the time we're living in now? Well, I mean, just to, on the Confederate statues, it, it, those were also intimidation. Uh, mm. They were put up to intimidate Black people who were uh, attempting to redress the civil rights and justices against them. And this was the way, I was going to say Southerners, but it wasn't just Southern. It was, mm. there were Northern uh, statues as well. To, to send a message like, don't, don't try it. Um, uh, we are in power and we will assert our power and you can look by the courthouse and see the power that we still have. So mm-hmm. they, they also, there were a whole lot of monuments put up in the 1960s as well mm-hmm. when the civil rights movement got going. I do think, um, you know, those things, those literal statues, as well as those cultural symbols are important for us to assess our own behavior and our own attitudes is like, how do we feel about equal rights? How do we feel about social justice? How do we feel about redressing the past? And 
um, if we are people of good conscience, um, we'll, we'll recognize that those things really are wrong and were done for the wrong reasons. And they should be cast out. Uh, we should try to improve ourselves. We shouldn't try to improve our cultural milieu. I mean, I, I don't see the value in preserving them um, very much. Um, you know, maybe th in this small little context, uh, nostalgia radio and the soundtrack at the supermarket ought to, you know, uh, ban those songs or get rid of those songs mm -hmm. because they're not they're not appropriate in, on some level for, you know, the 2020s. Or, or at least there should be a discussion um, at the very least to, to decide what kind of society we want to live in. I mean, um, when, I, when I think, you know, I, 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 I wonder why it is so difficult to, to have the battle over equal rights for everybody. It seems like such a strange um, battle that we're engaged in, you know, we see it every day now, you know, now that's moved to voting rights, you know, where we're trying to suppress the vote for the next election. And it's just like, that's not American. Like, uh, how does, how does, how can we be, um, you know, how can we, how can we be seeing that anything other than, you know, everybody gets a vote? I think it's the, the cliche that the past is always with us and, and it, it is constantly repeating or reviving in one way or another, you know, Nazis were a phenomenon of the 30s and the 40s. Yeah, except they're a phenomenon of the 2020s too. And so human nature doesn't change particularly uh, over time. There's racism and prejudice and bias, but the circumstances do. And, and we should be, we should know about these things in order to improve ourselves, to, to make a better society for everyone. Now, well, don't you think- well, let me just, because that answer just was, was to my question, really, which is, you know, to the Confederate statues, for example, and you said an incredibly important thing. I don't know that a lot of people really, really understand it was intimidation. How do we preserve yeah, about that? that I mean, either, how do we preserve that as a concept, as a as a teachable moment? We, you know, get it out of the context of the town square. Do you put that in a in a museum and say, this is what this is like. How do we, how do we make sure that people understand that that's why it was there, so that doesn't happen again? I mean, that's always the perplexing, whether we want to cancel things out or not. But we have to remember that that that's what that, the intention behind that. Yeah, and and I think that's a great point because context is everything. You see what people did back in whatever day it was. You see how they did things, and don't you think? What do you think about that? I mean. It always amazes me, and it probably shouldn't, that young people especially are constantly rediscovering things that I thought everybody knew. And, you know, even things that happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago, recent history. And the constant, the need to constantly remind them, yes, this was a thing. This was important in being a, a point in our history that may have changed the way people thought about things. I mean, this is why you know, I always hate doing anniversary journalism, but anniversary journalism is really important. Okay, Kent State, you know, happened in 1970. We just hit the 50th anniversary of it. Well, there's a lot of people who didn't live through that and don't know anything about that. And they're discovering, oh my God, the National Guard shot four students who were protesting a war. Well, you know, it's good to remind people of that. So we understand the past vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Confederate statues you know, don't destroy all of them, maybe put some of them away uh, in a museum or display them with proper context, run a plaque that says, look what the Daughters of the American Revolution did 100 years ago, and here's why they did it. We shouldn't allow it to stand without some understanding of what was going on at the time that this was placed there. You know, we have, we have such a lack of uh, teaching critical thinking at the moment, Right. So, so, you know, if you don't have it in the education, you know, I guess my question is, is that, is it, um, is it, when you look at it, are we on a progression going towards a positive direction overall, or are we, still, you know, violence is certainly less, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 this is a really broad topic, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I mean, we improve, we take two steps forward, we take one back, we take three sideways. I mean, it's not a clear 
trajectory, is it? You know, I have a whole rant about how the internet has, in some ways, when you balance out the positives and the negatives, we're no better off with the internet. I mean, here is this thing, this revolutionary thing that gives everybody access to all kinds of information. It also gives people access to mis and disinformation, and it's made it easier for people to be dumber, you know, and white supremacy, you know, conspiracy theories, all kinds of nonsense. We're constantly battling it. And if you look at, you know, what people believe but through public surveys, it's just a huge constituency for absolute, you know, Ignor ignorant information. And so even though you have this channel to put out the best and the easiest way to access it, it becomes a channel for stupidity. Oh, God. <laughs> it, it does. But, you know, you're asking, you're making me think about, well, what is, you know, what is journalism? What in the context of like, what is journalism? You know, Several years ago, Jesse and I interviewed the kind of the, the folks around the sort of the history of the journalism and the Pulitzer Prize and what that meant. But now, you know, you've done this work for a very long time and done really important work. So in the context of this media blitz and social media, how do we how do we have critical thinking? How do we determine what is the truth? Is there truth? I mean, you're now we got to get into those more intense questions. Yes. And 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 this is a can of worms that is just gigantic. And you know, I mean, I, I realize without trying to sound uh, self-inflating here, I realize that I've dedicated my life to facts, at least, you know, trying to get at facts. I won't get into truth. I'll just say that I've tried to put facts out there and put them in context. And that's what good journalists try to do. But there are lots and lots of countervailing forces, and it's never been more true than right now. You know, Facebook. What, Facebook is a platform that can be used for good or used for ill, and it's used for a lot of ill. And my whatever power or platform I have as a journalist, you have that, he has that, she has that, the man on the street has that. You know, in your pocket, as I like to say, there's a TV station, there's a newspaper, and you have access to it unfiltered at any time. You can broadcast to the world, you can publish to the world, and you don't necessarily have any standard ethical standards or professional standards to do it. It's very likely you have none whatsoever. So professional journalists, you know, of all kinds are competing against an entire ocean of people and information that is not of any kind of, you know, vetted or professional quality, just the way the world is. That's the way the world is now. But don't you think that at some point the, you know, the New York Times is the New York Times, you know, it's like we, we need these institutions to be there for us and there for a democracy to exist, you know, in, in some form, you need these institutions. You, you do. And thank you for saying that, Jesse. But, you know, I, I sometimes feel like the, the monks in the middle ages, you know, in the dark ages, keeping alive scholarship and classicism, you know, the classics, and they're fighting against the ignorance of kings and barons. And now the, the kings and the barons are everywhere and they're everyone. And um, not to say that the, the mainstream news media is somehow flawless, it certainly isn't, but it, it, it goes to a higher standard most of the time uh, that does not exist elsewhere. And this genie is out of the bottle. It's almost ridiculous at this point to, to, to point it out in some ways and, and to fight it. You can only live with and do the best that you can and have some integrity in doing it. But you know, there, there's lots and lots of people that have no integrity whatsoever and don't care about integrity. I mean, do you think, you know, when we see misinformation and disinformation, do you feel like it's with intention that those things are like that? Sure. Uh, it, it's absolutely with intention. Um, people believe what they want to believe. They don't want to, to check it or vet it in any way. They just want to make their point. In, the, in our newsroom, there's a, a, a rule of thumb, never read the comments, because if you read the comments, there are people who will put a bunch of nonsense underneath your hard-won, you know, facts, and it stands in some ways equal to, or at least close to equal to, the thing that you just reported. Um, if you go on Twitter, if you go on social media, 
you know, come on, it's a zoo. I, I can spend weeks and weeks uh, writing an article, reporting an article, checking my facts, having it go through editors and copy editors and everything, and it's destroyed within within days. I mean, that doesn't say that I should stop doing, you know, or trying to do what I do, but it's just that that's the wave that you will face um, in, in the world at large. Um, you know, this reassessment where we're canceling people, do you, do, how do you feel about that relative to some of these artists we were just talking about, the songs, you know, that we're talking about? I, I hate that phrase because we're not canceling people. Cancel culture is a phrase invented by the right in the same way that they invented PC. And it's the new PC. You know, in other words, when you sit, oh, that's so PC. Well, cancel culture is the updated way of saying I don't, uh, you know, uh, I am simply taking opposition to what you are saying and pointing out facts that might be inconvenient to you. And, you know, whether or if someone wants to respond to those contrary facts, they can. But I, 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 the, the, the examples of people being canceled are few and far between you know, have people been driven out of making a living in journalism or in, or in speaking? Very few people have. Have people been fired for speech that an employer might disagree with? Yes, they have, but maybe they should disagree with it. Maybe that speech was offensive to large groups of people, and maybe it was really kind of something that shouldn't, shouldn't be in the town square. Do you have plenty of ways to put out your nonsense. You just don't have to be employed by uh, a responsible employer putting it out. You know, where do you see this going? You know, I, I originally thought that sort of this, this kind of culture was a response to the last political uh, sort of situation. I thought, I, personally, I just thought when it ended, this would sort of subside, but it doesn't really have any any, you know, it doesn't seem like it's um, subsiding, not to say that I want it to subside, because some of it's really good. Um, uh, but I thought it would sort of de-escalate, and it doesn't seem to be that way. Well, no, look at our last election, and, and look at our last president, you know, he, he lied a lot. And it's one thing for a politician to lie, and to lie a lot, but it gives license to the people who support that politician to also lie. Part of the most destructive thing about Trump was his efforts to undermine oppositional reporting and, and research. And that is, this isn't an anti-Trump rant, it's an anti-reality you know, anti rant, which is just because you don't like something doesn't make it not true. Many of the things he railed against were absolutely true. They were just inconvenient for him. And he has continued to do so about the election. What, in some ways, the, the counter trend is to call what he is doing a lie. Everybody refers to it now without hesitation as the big lie. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into calling it the big lie, but it is not true. And uh, we should say it's not true. Uh, but I think the last four years of Trump were, you know, a, a, a lesson for everyone in journalism and, and in truth, ultimately, or in facts, at least, where there was a, a big force of people who wanted explicitly to undermine fact and factual reporting, and they're continuing to do so. Yeah, but what's the lesson? Because they're continuing to do so. They're still, quote, not, I don't know what you would call them, spokespeople, media people that support, you know, support what he's saying, that the election was stolen. I mean, all of that. So what is the lesson and what is the antidote to that? Like, what do you do? Well, I mean, I guess one lesson is ideology trumps facts, uh, not to make a pun on, on the name, but um, if you firmly believe in something, you can live in a world in which you constantly reinforce that something. Um, and we have, going back to the internet, now given people the means to constantly reinforce it. You know, before the internet, the mainstream media was a kind of self-policing factual environment. Um, there weren't that many speakers in the town square. And so those that were advancing things that were factually untrue were called out for them. And this could be self-policed. If you only have three networks, if you only have 
you know, a few dozen major news newspapers or what have you, when they got it wrong, they were seriously disciplined for that. Now we have a free for all and there is no discipline for non-factual speech. It flourishes, it, it, it expands, it, it metastasizes. So that the power of the mainstream media to vet what is and is not factual information is severely restricted and diminished. And so, you know, good luck everybody with your free for all, but that doesn't say a lot for what is going to be truthful, accurate, in context kind of information. And so you have this thriving marketplace of false information and it leads to a challenge to uh, a, a, an election. It, lead, it, it leads to the undermining of democracy is what it leads to. Um, it's dangerous, it's scary. And you know, no matter how many times we call it out, there are plenty of people who disagree. Yeah. When we see, um, you know, people say there were tourists in the, you know, rotunda, <laughs> right? Like, like there's a certain level of cognitive dissonance going on there. You know, because people are dying, people are getting their heads smashed in. There's weapons being fired. You know, how do you how do you you see that level of cognitive dissonance? The people who are actually barricading the doors are saying they were just tourists. I mean, this is, you know, very strange under any other, you know, sort of thinking. You know, well, you see that, and I see that, and Priscilla presumably sees that too. But if you start out with the idea that Trump was screwed out of his rightful election, that these were patriots standing up to the election steal. If you go down the rabbit hole of all of these various lies and line them up, you can swim in a sea of information that reinforces your mistaken notions. And you believe, you end up believing what you want to believe. And it's, it's hard to combat that. I mean, the only, you know, it used to be said that the only solution for a certain kind of speech that you didn't like was more speech. Well, we got plenty of speech. There's tons of speech now. But if you're living in a paradigm that says elections stolen, Democrats bad, news media lies, I mean, where, where, do, you, where do you start? Um, it's very hard to penetrate that world, that paradigm and that worldview. Um, you would have thought that COVID would have been a, a unifier of people and ideas. It, it seems like maybe uh, COVID has been a, a failure as a test for climate, for, for you know, bringing people together and moving on to the next, um, you know, the, the next place that we're going to have to go as a as a culture, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, I, I, and I think that's a great point um, that this has accelerated the sense of paranoia. Um, you know, people respond to crises in very odd and very dangerous and very self-destructive ways. Um, you know, I, I always say that, and people have said that you lose an argument when you start talking about the Nazis, but let's look at the 1930s there was an extreme crisis, an economic crisis called the depression. And it drove Germany, you know, at the time, maybe the most scientifically advanced and educated society in the world into this downward spiral of, of Nazism and murder, ultimately murder and world war. Um, it almost drove the United States, also a pretty advanced society, into extremism too. Fortunately, democracy held together well enough uh, for us to, to keep it together. But the pandemic in some ways is a parallel. Um, you have these extreme conditions of isolation, disease, death, uh, government you know, locked in, imposed lockdowns, what have you. Yeah, people are going to respond in this, with this sense of panic to this. And, and it, I don't want to minimize it. You know, people's lives were interrupted, hurt. Um, they lost their jobs. They're an extremist. And that drives people to extreme ideas. 
And I do think ultimately the pandemic accelerated our downward spiral of misinformation. You, you sort of thought there would be a moment like, you know, the McCarthy time where it's like, it just didn't hold up anymore. And everybody looked at it and said, wait a minute, that's, you know, this is ridiculous, right? Yep. But that sort of never happened. I mean, do you, you know, what do you, what do you think it takes to move us forward now as a society? <laughs> It, it actually did happen, Jesse. I mean, when you think about McCarthy, he, he was able to exploit the, you know, the communist threat for a good long while. He was called out by certain uh, news media, and the opposition did build to him over time, and, and up to the point of the Army McCarthy hearings, and Edward R. Monroe's famous broadcast uh, calling him out. If you remember the movie Good Night and Good Luck, it's, it's really admirably portrayed there. But there had, it took a, quite a number of months going on, you know, a couple of years before McCarthy was really uh, discredited and called out. But again, what's, what's useful in that context is, is look at the world of 1954 compared to the world of 2021 very different media environment, very different political environment. You know, communism was, we were afraid of it, but there was also, you know, a, a news media, uh, this thing called television also, which, you know, was able to, in effect, restore some order to the, to the situation. And it wasn't so much the Army McCarthy hearings, it was the televising of the Army McCarthy hearings that really exposed McCarthy, I, I think, and discredited him. Do you feel like there's something now that that can do the same thing? Yeah. No, because there's no media entity. There's no single uh, unity uh, of, of, of the media in which you can create a consensus. Um, no. uh, not, not that I want the media to agree on things. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I want them to agree on facts, yes, but you know, you, if, if ABC, NBC, and CBS got together and said, you know, we're going to dispute this election lie, uh, if the Washington Post, the New York Times, PBS, et cetera, all got together and disputed this election lie, um, it would make it go away. Well, mm -hmm. let me tell you something. All of those media entities have disputed this election lie, and the election lie does not go away. Just right. go to Arizona right now, and you'll see. Um, so, you know, we've diminished... Uh, any kind of media authority. Um, people don't, it's not so much that they don't believe the media as they have alternative sources of information to tell them otherwise. And, um, you know, it, it, it's hard in some ways to keep a cohesive society under those circumstances. You know, it strikes me what you're saying. It's, it's, it's almost even before the social media, but also the onslaught of cable television, because that's really where we started to just turn on what you wanted to hear as opposed to those three news stations, which again, I guess some people would say, well, they were only just telling us something anyway. There would always be that fringe that would say, even ABC, NBC, CBS 50 years ago, what weren't they telling us? And so it feels like it's an older problem than just the problem of the United States trying to grapple. Yeah, it, it is. You, you are correct. There have always been fringes in the United States, but the fringes were small and the fring fringes were marginalized in the mainstream. Um, and so you had a, you know, John Birch Society, um, which helped make Barry Goldwater a candidate in 1964. Mm -hmm. But look what happened to Barry Goldwater. He got buried by Johnson in the 64 election because yeah. he was perceived as extreme. And, you know, uh, Barry Goldwater looks kind of you know, liberal Republican in some ways right now. Uh, it, yeah. we've, we've changed what uh, the definition of, of mainstream and fringe is. And fringes have moved, well, the fringe is now, is now the Republican Party, the things that are going on uh, into, in, in, into a Trump party. Um, it's just kind of a fact. So the difference is the center is not holding and the center is, has fallen apart in many ways. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'd also uh, amend your, your, your timeline here. I, I think uh, talk radio was a bigger factor preceding cable television. Cable television didn't really become polarizing until, right. you know, the late 90s. 
Rush Limbaugh really had his ascendancy in the late 80s and early 90s. So, and then there are many Rush Limbaugh's around the country too who were doing the same thing. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. presidential medal winner, <laughs> of honor winner, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have to leave our audience with something to like, I guess we need, so what, what do you think we need, Paul, as a, what do we need to kind of for young people? What do we want or anyone, you know, if we're gonna kind of put forth, uh, we need more thinking, critical thinking, Jesse talked about critical thinking. It has thinking. to be critical and thinking. What else how do we be? How do we create a new uh, sort of generation or we will of, that are going to really scrutinize and help us I mean, we can always we can also ask always ask the, the next generation to innovate here. So, what would be your call out? What's your ask? Uh, I I I know it sounds absurd, but I I think if you ban the internet, you would you would bring people back to a more a, a, a greater consensus. Let's just say that. And I'm yeah. not saying the consensus was always right. It it wasn't always right, but. This, this is a, a, an issue that will never be put back together because yeah. the media landscape has been so leveled and young people, you know, they're, 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 they're in, into many causes that are, that are very beneficial that my generation is not. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I have a lot of hope for them, but I also see that there is a lot of, uh, it's, it's falling apart that our media world has so fallen apart that we, we can't really put it, expect it to be put back together. Well, Paul, thank you so much for thank spending you. time with us today. Taking so us down huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Opie and uh, yeah. sure that we all want to look yeah. forward to. But, you know, it's one, I'll leave you with one thought, Paul. We had a, somebody recently on a, a human rights activist, social justice activist, and she she said it's easy to hide on the internet. I think that's what you're talking about. And when you talked about talk radio, you can you can hide and you know people can listen. And you could just call things out with no light on it, no accountability, yeah. no visibility. So I think it's a really something for us all to think about as well. Yeah. Being yes, I, I uh, we we've uh, tried to address this problem in a little way, which is should people give their real identity when they post mm. comments? You know, it's very easy to hide behind yeah. the screen name. Um, uh, and it, we haven't really been able to solve that element of it. So yes, yeah. uh, anonymity, anonymity gives people a lot of bravado that is totally unearned. Yeah, well, thank you well, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Right, oh. Keep doing what you do. Yeah, yeah, we, we really appreciate it. it. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah.